And so I want to share with you some stories about how we grew the business and where some of our successes were and where they weren't. One of our earlier products was a product called Harlem Honeybush. It is a South African red tea. There's um, two types of tea that are indigenous to South Africa, honeybush and rooibos. Actually, they're not technically teas. They're really an herb. Um, but this was a, a project I was very excited about. Uh, I got to go to, to visit uh, in South Africa. And honeybush traditionally grows in the mountains. And a co-op supported with USAID funding um, helped the South African farmers each got a, a hectare, basically an acre of land, for them to cultivate the first crop of organic honeybush. Normally, honeybush grows in the mountains, and so you can pick it when the flowers come out, but that's challenging. Of course, you can't get organic certification in the mountains. Um, there's snakes in the mountains, so it's hard to harvest. But when they started to cultivate it, they, could, they got a much higher yield, and of course, they could supply it to companies interested in buying it. And we were really the first one to do that. Um, so I was totally excited about the concept. We were creating economic empowerment at a community level. Uh, but so that all worked. But the marketing and I, and we really failed. Um, you know, we, we gave it a name that I think doesn't really communicate what we're selling. We made it unsweetened, which was a tough taste, not very accessible for people. And then, you know, because the supplier was not that developed, the, one of their shipments was moldy. And obviously, that created a little bit of a taste challenge for people. <laughs> so the product didn't work. Um, but for me, I, I felt like I really wanted to make that happen. And so uh, a few years ago, we brought out pomegranate red tea with goji berry. Same ingredients, except now it's sweeter. Uh, it's got pomegranate and goji berry, which are more functional fruits. This tea is the third best-selling bottled tea in the natural foods industry. Um, so clearly, um, it's successful. By the way, the, the first two was Honest Tea Moroccan Mint, and the second was Honest Tea Pichu Lalong. So we were happy to take the third spot, too. Um, but I think the key lesson for me was this, this resonates with the consumer. The first one resonated with me and our mission. But if it, only, you know, if it, were, if it matters to you, but you, you know, if you can't get your consumer excited about it, then you, know, you're, you're, you, may, be, you, know, um, do it, you may feel good, but you're not doing good. Uh, for the community, and so obviously we've been able, this tea is fair trade certified, we've been able to, to buy a lot more ingredients um, from the same community. We don't get to share the same story um, through the bottle, but, but the impact is much greater. The, uh, the, the major stumbling blocks, if you will, that we face um, in terms of social enterprise and, and social entrepreneurship, I guess, um, is be, be, being a business while being true to our mission and being socially conscious and socially forward thinking. Um, one of the things that we made a commitment to several years ago is that we were going to pay every frontline employee uh, the, dis the District of Columbia's, start with the District of Columbia's living wage, which is well more than twice the minimum wage. We also made a commitment that we were going to pay 100% of everybody's health insurance. You know, for many years, we were paying 90%, but we still had a significant portion of our population who didn't want to pay that extra $10 a pay period to get insurance, and we just didn't feel that, that we could take that risk. So we paid 100%. Um, we start off, everyone has, we have a very liberal paid vacation policy. Um, everyone has short-term and long-term disability and a life insurance policy, and we make a, a, a significant contribution or a match to a retirement policy. So when we're, say, for example, our catering business, um, people want to use us, and that's great. Um, but there's also an assumption, because we're tied to a nonprofit, we're tied to DC Central Kitchen, that it's going to be cheaper. Um, fact of the matter is, it probably costs us a lot more to run our business than a normal catering company. Uh, so our prices aren't cheaper. Uh, and that's you know, a, a barrier for us. Uh, so it's interesting that, you know, in terms of our personnel, we don't have a problem, you know, we don't have a problem getting people or attracting people. People are, other folks are attracted to the kitchen and want to be part of that mission and that discussion. Um, but it's hard to compete sometimes as a social business um, because if indeed, as we've committed to do, to uh, do what we say others should do and to set an example. You know, hiring ex-offenders, paying a living wage, providing benefits, all those things. Uh, and again, we would be wildly uh, even more hypocritical than we probably are already if we didn't do that. And I, I would consider that a failure. If we were running a successful business, but we were paying people minimum wage, no time off, no benefits, that's not, that's not a, a success. 
I've, I've had um, folks come to us with great business ideas that can affect social change. But I think the question one needs to ask is, um, what's, what's the end game here? You know, is, um, is your desire to build social equity or equity um, or personal equity? And how much wealth do you want to create for your community versus how much wealth you want to generate individually? There's no right or wrong answer here. Um, you can still affect um, positive change and make a profit. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I, but it's a matter of the, it's, it's what is, what is your, at the end of what is your organizational mission? And oftentimes I think it, you know, it, it takes some thinking about because if the purpose of your business is to um, sell a particular widget, then my recommendation is sell that widget, make a lot of money, and then with the profit, then you can decide about being philanthropic. And many of my donors are individuals that have done just that. I think sometimes when some people blur the lines too much and they try to be green or they try to be socially respons responsible, they're not doing their shareholders justice um, or, they're not doing them, or they're not being true to themselves or to, the, or to the customers they're serving. So I think it's really important to really think through what are your values? What are, what are you trying to accomplish? and then go about trying to be as transparent as possible in, in, in doing that. So let's make some observations about you know, what, what, what at least for me can I draw from the decisions we've made and how we've evolved. The first thing is um, pay attention to what resonates. Certainly it has to resonate with you. I, 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 I can guarantee you if I'd gone after the urinary tract infections idea, I would not be here today. Well, maybe I would. I mean, maybe I found, would find a way to make it socially innovative, but it didn't resonate with me. It wasn't something that I was fired up about. And, I'm sort of scared. I actually, MBA students can relate to this. So, so this week I was in, um, I was up at 3.30, 4.30, and 6.30, three days in a row, um, sort of going to bed around midnight. And it wasn't, I was working, but it was also, I just couldn't sleep. I'm just so fired up about what we're doing. So I wouldn't be doing that with urinary tract infections. <laughs> um, but you also have to pay attention to what resonates with your audience. So the Harlem Honeybush, I was so fired up about it, but I, it was at least, a, 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 even if it, it was a failure on my part or on our part to market it to, so that it resonated with our consumers, whereas the pomegranate red tea does resonate. You also have to evolve. You really, if things aren't working, um, you, you, you can't blame the market. And this is sad. I was just talking with a friend about how we had to discontinue our gold rush tea. It's, um, a lot of people love it, but the market was not rewarding it. I can tell you when we bought out the pomegranate red tea, it's just been a... Uh, uh, on a skyrocket. It's just been zooming up, you know, the um, sales. So you can't blame the market. The market is the market. You just have to learn from it and you have to evolve. And I, I this is one of our, our favorite quotes. It shows up under um, one of our label, you know, on our labels, we put messages. It's not the strongest that survives nor the most intelligent. It's the one that is most adaptable to change. So you have to change, but you also really have to stand for something. And this is important. You really have to think about the future you want to create and you have to be part of it. Um, if you are, evolving by following everybody, you're not going to win. And just certainly as an entrepreneur, you know, look, if we came out as just another sweet tea company, yeah, I mean, we'd, you know, maybe we'd sell, we would have sold more tea in the beginning, but we certainly wouldn't have been attractive to a company like Coca-Cola because there are a lot of sweet tea companies out there. Why we were attractive to Coca-Cola is because we stood for something. And, you know, this idea of fidelity to a brand and to what you stand for, really, and this is as, as, a, as a student, as a leader, um, you, are, you are your own brand, and when you can make it clear that you'll stand for something, if people know, hey, well, you know, we need someone to go cut a deal, it's going to be a little dirty, and you know, that person's not going to do it, well, that may hurt you in the short term, but in the long term, they'll know there's integrity there. Here's a lesson, two of my favorite Chinese proverbs. These are on their uh, bottle caps. So the first one is what you, when you walk into our office, this is what it says on the wall. Those who say it cannot be done should not interrupt the people doing it. And I, in, in a sense, this is what the center is about, right? Um, that, and this is where change happens, you know, that um, it, it wouldn't be, if it, were, if it were easy, it wouldn't be change. Um, so you have to be committed to, to the difficult to make, to make it worthwhile. And yet at the same time, the importance of change, if we don't change the direction we are headed, we will end up where we are going. And for me, this was very easy. Um, and you look at the beverage industry and where it was headed. You know, uh, soft drinks were the single largest source of sugar in the American diet um, and growing. And... I give Coca-Cola credit because they recognized that um, the direction they were headed as a company was, is, is, was not a positive one. 
um, soda sales. Um, basically, when we launched in 1998, since, since 1998, soda sales, Coca-Cola sales have gone down 10%, just the brand Coca-Cola. Um, so they had to diversify. Um, and yet they were not going to be able to create a company like this on their own. Um, and so it's, an, it's, a, it's a wonderful irony that we set out to you know, change the beverage industry. And we're now partnering with the largest uh, beverage company to make that happen.